So good afternoon. Uh, I'm Candace Moon. Oh, Lisa, I didn't know if you were going to be talking or not. That's why. Okay, okay, just briefly, Candace. Um, hi, I'm Lisa from the library with me is Candace Moon, our speaker today. We're going to give everyone a chance to get logged on. Thank you for being with us today. Very excited to have Candace back. She's been a regular speaker at the library on an annual basis, at least since I've been working at the library. So really glad to have her here by Zoom. And a couple of housekeeping things for you today. We are offering CLE credit for this session. So once I get the Zoom report that verifies who attended today, I will be sending those certificates out by email this afternoon. So be looking for that. Um, we do have a survey that you will see a link to when you sign off at the end today. We sure appreciate if you would take a minute or two to take our survey. So thank you in advance for that. And then this is also an interactive session as usual uh, for uh, these participatory webinars. You can ask your questions of Candace using the Q&A function. We would ask that you use that. You will see that somewhere on your screen. It's at the bottom of mine um, with two speech bubble. And so um, use that icon if you want to post any questions. And Candace will be leaving a few minutes at the end to try to get to as many of those as possible. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce Candace. Candace is known as the craft beer attorney. And we're lucky to have her here local in San Diego with her boutique law firm that specializes in the craft beer industry, which she has been involved in since 2009. Um, although she's based here in San Diego, she has worked with hundreds of craft breweries all over the country. And so again, we're really lucky to have her here for this very interesting topic. And I have my water here today, but hey, if anyone here is at home watching and you want to sip an adult beverage while you're listening to this program, go ahead and do it. Uh, we're all for that. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to Candace. Awesome. Thank you, Lisa. Um, yeah, I am, I am not going to, <laughs> it's a little early for me. I got too much work to do after this. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so as Lisa mentioned, uh, I can just moon. Um, my practice is uh, the craft beer attorney. I've been doing, working with craft breweries since 2009. Uh, I've probably worked with almost every craft brewery in San Diego, at least in some uh, capacity or other. Um but uh, my practices kind of run the gambit of I was a solo, then I had my own firm, then I joined a national firm. And then right before actually, or the year before COVID, I went back to being on my own, um, but have in the meantime brought on um, a few employees. <laughs> so I guess I'm starting a firm again. Um, there, I, I will say this, if, if you did attend this presentation back in 2020, uh, not much has changed. I mean, we're still in COVID. We're still dealing with COVID as much as I think we all thought we wouldn't be by now. Um, we still are. So uh, unfortunately, uh, not much has changed. Um, some of the things we thought would happen have happened, and we'll discuss that. I even have a slide about COVID uh, from last time. So I'm going to touch on the biggest challenges of working with craft breweries. Um, I, you know, I was, I usually will answer questions along the way if possible, but I don't, I think the way with my screen sharing, I don't know that I'll see your questions, along the way, so I'll definitely do them all at the end, um, at least as many as I can get to, and my contact information is on the last slide, so at the end, and if it's not, I'll put it in the chat, but you can always contact me with any questions, uh, happy to answer those. Um, so I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes, or till about 12.45 and then leave time for those questions. Uh, so let's, let's jump in. So I'm gonna start with the main issues that arise when working with craft breweries. And in a lot of ways, this is probably the same issues that many of you find working with any small business, especially small businesses started by mom and pops, people who don't have a ton of business experience. So the first one is entity choice. Um, a lot of people will come in I mean, you've got people who don't realize they should have an entity, uh, uh, as well as people who have already decided on an entity choice made simply on what they've heard, what they've talked to people about, and not necessarily on their specific situation of what type of entity is going to be the best for what they're looking to do. And there are always um, various reasons for which entity you want to choose. So, one of the biggest things is they don't 
even understand the protection that an entity can provide. And so um, really helping them understand why they want to have an entity uh, in a lot of cases will help them choose which entity is going to be the best fit for their situation. Um, the other biggest reason, so I'll tell you what I've run into recently as, as I've during the last couple of years, I've taken on a couple of new clients that are what I will call brand owners. So they aren't manufacturing. They're not, they, they basically had a great idea, a great brand marketing idea, recipe, but they're not the ones making the product. They're just out there marketing and, and trying to sell it. And as a result, they, um, I have one company who started with a California LLC. Then they converted to a California corporation, probably based on their accountant's advice. And then they decided to do a Delaware corporation. Um, all of this after they started their licensing, which to some extent, whether you're a sole prop or an entity, um, once you have your license, if you change your entity or you know go from a sole prop to an entity, you have to redo all your licensing. Um, this was especially difficult with this company because they had also started selling into other states. And every time you sell into another state, you have to do licensing in that state. So we're having to redo all their licensing um, because of the change of the entity. Um, and that changed because, you know, they, they set up their first entity by themselves. Then they got an accountant. Then they got um, a corporate law firm to uh because they wanted to fundraise i mean and, and this is all very normal because you know you'll start out with a certain idea um but ideally you know they're talking to an attorney in the beginning because my biggest thing is is what's your growth plan what are you looking to ultimately do and that's ideally you want to pick that ultimate entity that is going to work for your ultimate uh business plan so um, and I will tell you, cleaning this up has been a huge pain, um, <laughs> and a lot of paperwork and, oh, and just to make it more fun, they named the Delaware company, the exact same name as the California company. So everyone's confused. Um, anyway, it's really important to help them understand what entity is going to work for them. Uh, and that it is important to have. I mean, that's, that's kind of two different things, but um, the ultimate entity is ideally the one you want to start with because it is a hassle to redo all your licensing if you change your entity. And the reason, even though in California you can convert an LLC to a corp, uh, you have to get a new EIN. And EIN is what uh, the, uh, the federal employee identification number is what all your licensing is based on. So even though it's the same company, it just converted from one form to another, um, certainly the California ABC, as I found out, is going to force you to redo uh, your license as if it is an entirely new entity. So, uh, yeah, definitely you want to work with them at the very beginning on entity choice. And then, of course, entity changes. Um, one of the biggest issues I've seen over the years uh, in this business, and again, I think any small business, is that your founders, you know, who agreed in the very beginning on what they wanted to do and how they wanted to do it have, you know, um, their lives have changed. Different things have happened. And, you know, maybe they want to go a different direction. Um, maybe they never discussed it thoroughly in the beginning, what direction they wanted to take the company. And in some cases, you know, you're, you're, the biggest things you'll see is where one founder um, maybe wants to stay small and keep it the way, you know, it is. And one founder wants to grow. Um, and if they did not set up a good operating agreement in the beginning, how to do these things and how to manage these things isn't going to be spelled out. Um, and I find this a lot, even if they did use an attorney, um, a lot of times, um, you know, the, the details may not be there of if disagreements happen, how are they going to, um, kind of split the baby as it were. Um, Sorry, I'm saying I'm a lot. I'm going to blame. I, I had COVID last month, so I'm going to. I'm using my COVID brain excuse as long as I can. Um, there we go again. 
So it's really important as much as you can to help them think about, I mean, and this is, I, I kind of joke this as an attorney, I'm the worst case scenario person that the, I'm there to tell them, bring up the worst case scenario. What if you and your wife get divorced? That's, that's my favorite one when, when I have the couples who are starting a business. Um, you know, I usually preference it with, I'm sure this would never happen, but. Um, so there's that. Uh, and a lot of times you're, especially in this situation, you'll get friends who are starting a business together. I do a lot of operating agreements with a shotgun provision because that does kind of make for, should you have, you know, a disagreement between founders to the point that they can't work together anymore. And that definitely has happened quite a few times. Um, it basically gives them an out that's, you know, fair to both of them. So this is where, you know, I've got two people who both really want to start a brewery. So when they can't work together anymore and one has to leave and both want to keep the brewery, how do they deal with that situation? And if you're not familiar with the shotgun provision, um, I guess basically whoever gets to that point first makes an offer. Um, or basically what they do is they set the price and then the other person gets to decide, are they going to buy or are they going to sell? So it basically gives the first person doesn't have the motivation to set a price too high or too low, um, depending on if they want to keep it or if they want to get out. Um, so far, luckily, uh, we haven't had to use it yet in any of my, my companies, but that's currently, um, at least when you have two, uh, a, a good place to start, I think, when when eventually both people may want to keep the business. I think uh, a lot of times in the spouse situations, it's a little bit easier um, because one person really wants to start the business and the, the spouse or partner is looking to support them. And so it's one person's passionate project with the other coming along for the ride. At the same time, though, I do like to remind people that as things change, they should think about changing the operating agreement. So let's say you do have a, uh, a married couple. Um, let's say the wife is the one who's passionate about brewing and the husband's like, sure, this sounds cool. I'll do this. Um, but as they start the business and as, you know, a couple of years in, maybe they're both really invested as much, you know, one, both invested about the same. Uh, then it might be time to amend that operating agreement and change it to a shotgun clause rather than assuming that, you know, there's still the same level of involvement and attachment as there was before the uh, business was started. So um, good reminder, I, I do tell my clients and whether they do it or not, because I don't, I don't always talk to them, you know, a year or two down the road, but I do always remind them and, and recommend that on a regular basis, as, as the founders and owners that they get together, whether it's monthly, quarterly, but away from the business, happy hour dinner, and keep talking to each other about the big picture, where they both stand, what they both want, and make sure they're on the same page. And if they aren't, then start, you know, before someone gets angry, gets fed up, you know, they, they know they're going different directions before they've gotten there and maybe... Um, amending the operating agreement at that point or kind of making a plan for how they're going to move forward uh, in those situations. But um, again, I probably know different from any other small business. Uh, pretty familiar situation, I think. Okay, this is actually definitely a lot of what's going on right now is uh, changes in entities in the situation of mergers, acquisitions, um, and we'll actually talk about bankruptcy, a few more slides. But due to COVID, a lot of businesses, uh, especially, I mean, a lot of small businesses of, of all types have probably had to um, shift the way they do business and try to figure out a way to make it through the pandemic without necessarily being able to do business the way they have in the past. And I think this is hugely true for hospitality. Restaurants and bars, um, probably even more than the breweries, because at least the breweries have you know, a physical product they can sell to go. And I know California has done a lot to help uh, the restaurant industry um, with some of the to-go um, requirements and allowances. So, but, and just in the last few weeks, um, 
there was news. So Sweetwater, um, which uh, is a brewery out of the Southeast that also is a huge um, stakeholder in, uh, in cannabis, uh, purchased Green Flash or Green Flash slash Alpine. Um, not sure what, uh, I mean, will be interesting to see what they're going to do with uh, those brands, uh, those outlets. Um, Miller Coors uh, closed down St. Archer, um, which um, I did read that um, Kings and Convicts had acquired it. So I don't really know if they took over the company, if they've taken over the building. But, you know, I'm, I, I've read conflicting uh, reports, so it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Um, but we are having a lot of changes. Uh, in the industry, um, definitely small craft brewers acquiring other small craft brewers um, because they want to stay craft. Uh, but again, it's 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 tough times. Uh, so this has been a big um, a big area that's become a lot more common than certainly it was when I started in this industry. Um, and it was, I mean, it was starting before COVID, but I think COVID has really brought it to the forefront where some of the small guys are, I mean, for no, uh, for lack of a better uh, way of explaining it, kind of banding together to, to stay small, stay craft, um, but be able to kind of survive the economic climate that we're in. Um, so that's becoming a lot more common. <laughs> this has never changed, unfortunately. Um, and, and I think this is just due to uh, ignorance um, on the part of a lot of small business people is understanding securities law um, and what those laws require them to do. Um, <clears throat> I continually see, and thank God, not clients of mine, but um, businesses posting on Facebook or LinkedIn that they're looking for investors. And, you know, and generally when you're trying to do uh, a private offering, uh, Falling under Reg D, you can't advertise um, those offerings. There, are, um, so a lot of people just don't understand how it works. Trying to raise money and by selling equity in their company, and all the paperwork that goes along with that. Um, so, I mean, I've, I mean, I've, I've, <laughs> I feel like I've seen it all. Um, I will say this: if there's anyone. Uh, on this call who does securities law, I'm always looking for references. Um, I do not do securities law. I will do, I do very basic, now that I'm back on my own, um, I tend to do very basic business formations. And if there is a capital raise involved, I send them to a corporate attorney or a securities attorney. Um, so feel free to let me know. Um, but yeah, and I, I think one of the other problems, I, I have one, I'll call a prospective client because he's not official yet. Um, who, and this is very typical in craft brewing. Um, this guy is an amazing brewer, wants to start his own place, has no money, has people who are more than willing to invest in him, but he doesn't even have the like small base of money to hire a corporate attorney to set up uh, the business that would allow him to take investor money uh, and of course protect him um, to get the money that people are willing to invest in him. So he's kind of in this catch too, because he, I mean, a lot of these guys really don't have, um, you know, even $10,000 to put into uh, trying to put this together and to follow these laws correctly, um, if they even know they exist. So I think that's also where uh, they run into problems. Um, and yeah, so anyway, that's a big one. So any corporate attorneys who would be, you know, happy to set up a, a brewery for stock ownership. I'm, I've got some people who'd be interested. Entering into agreements about council. Another one of my favorites. Um, this is a constant, um, point. So one thing, and again, I'm sure all small businesses these guys do not want to spend money. I mean, who does? And especially in these times. But they tend to sign contracts without having anyone review them first. They, um, and this is a very contract-heavy industry. And certain ones, I mean, there's certain things I never 
uh, reviewed because people would just sign them because they were so standard until, of course, people started needing to get out of them. So a few years ago, hops contracts became a big thing because hops were becoming, um, I don't want to say there were shortages, but people needed to know that they could get the specific kind of hops because, you know, their flagship beer required a certain type and they needed to make sure they could get that. So they would enter into these hops contracts, um, basically committing to buying a certain amount on a certain time schedule, which was great until we got to COVID and they didn't quite need as much of the hops because they couldn't make the beer or sell the beer. And unfortunately, these hops contracts were virtually impossible to get out of. Um, so that's that's been a very fun uh, way to 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 start reviewing it inevitably i'm reviewing contracts that people want to get out of that were never reviewed when they went into sometimes that works most of the time it's really difficult um so i i, I just saw the my little menu popped up so i just saw a question um jumping back a bit how often do people get involved in the very substantial investment of this type without a lawyer you'd be amazed um, I'm always kind of, I will say this, people trying to get an investment will often do this without an attorney. Um, the people investing on the other hand, uh, they almost always, or at least people who are invest, investing large amounts of money generally have an attorney on their side, which is a lot of times when the brewery will go, oh, I guess I need someone to look at this. Um, or as I point out to them, if I get them ahead of all this, you need to have, you know, your ducks in a row. You need to have your paperwork correct. You need to be registered. And 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 I'm going to, when I say registered with the SEC, meaning you need to have at least logged with the SEC that you are doing a fundraise, a capital raise that does not require a full registration. Um, because if I'm the attorney for the investor, I'm going to go check and see if you've done that. Uh, and if you haven't, then i that's a red flag on my side that I'm not sure this person knows what they're doing. And before I allow my client to give them a hundred thousand dollars, I want to know, you know, that this is, you know, a, a company that is doing things correctly, that knows how to follow the requirements, because that's the other thing is, especially in the alcohol industry is this is a highly, one of the most highly regulated industries you can be in. And there is so much that as a, um, as a manufacturer, you have to do in terms of record keeping and reporting. And, you know, on top of all the things that any other business has to do, if people aren't doing it correctly from the beginning, I'm going to be concerned. Certainly if I'm looking to give them a large amount of money. And so I try to make sure anyone I talk to when I have the chances that you really want to be set up as perfectly as you can before asking for money. Now, <clears throat> I will also say about, and how to, honestly, my sense of time is all warped now because of COVID, but I'm going to say five years, it might've been longer. Whenever Ballast Point sold for a billion dollars, a whole lot of people thought that a brewery was a great way to make a lot of money. And I think you had a lot more people who were willing to invest uh, without necessarily doing all their due diligence. Um, I do think that since then, I mean, I will pretty much say to anyone, if you want to make money, don't, don't invest in a brewery. Um, my clients probably wouldn't want to hear that, but it is truly a passion business. This is not, a, there are much easier ways to make money. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's been interesting right after balance point sold. Oh my God. Everyone wanted to get in. And I think, um, <laughs> Once COVID hit, and of course, once ballast was sold um, for, I don't think we know how much uh, Constellation sold it for, but I'm sure it was a lot less than a billion. Um, that was kind of a wake up call, I think, to the industry that definitely, you're not going to see that that number again. <clears throat> so anyway, um, back to, so back to agreements without counsel, which I think kind of goes hand in hand with that. Um, there are quite a few contracts, especially in the beginning, uh, that are, you know, probably big ticket items. So a lease review, this is a hugely important thing, but leases are, you know, easily 30 pages long 
And half the time, those 30 pages were used to be legal, and then they were shrunk to go onto your letter size paper. Um, so a lot of legalese, very small print, um, but a very, very important um, contract that you're going to be stuck in for, you know, five to 10 years in a lot of cases. Um, one thing I do, kind of the way that I, and I hate to use the word sell because I don't think that's correct, but I, I tell people the way to value the cost of a contract review is how much will this contract cost you if it goes bad? And then how much is it going to cost to have it reviewed ahead of time to make sure you're as safe as you can be going into it? Um, I mean, a, a 10 year lease contract, I mean, that could be worth like $300,000, in which case a $3,000 lease review is a pretty good investment. Um, so lease reviews are a huge one. I also, oh, distribution agreements are, should be a no brainer. I, I try, and it's amazing how many people will sign things and just don't, and, you know, don't realize, um, what they've gotten themselves into. The biggest landmine when it comes to distribution agreements is every state has different laws regarding um, beer franchise laws, their spirits franchise laws, and their wine franchise laws. Um, and every state is different. So if you're looking at a, dis a distribution agreement from another state for a California brewery or winery um, or distillery, you've got to make sure that the contract reflects the appropriate state regulations because that's what uh, the contract's gonna be held to. Uh, you cannot contract out a franchise law a lot of the time, most of the time. And distribution contracts are almost always extremely distributor friendly as, as are the franchise laws. So you've gotta be very, very careful going into them um, and making sure that you understand or your, you and your client understand what they're getting into. So, um, anyway, they really hate contract review. <laughs> Next, registration and updates. So there are tons of agencies, state and federal, that they need to register with. Generally getting them registered is not so difficult. Reminding them and keeping them on top of updating everyone is a little more uh, difficult. So they do need to update, especially their state and federal licenses when things change, specifically people uh, who have ownership in the organization. That's a big one. Uh, I will also guarantee you that a number of companies, the person who gave their social security number to the IRS to get the EIN may or may not even be with the company anymore. Uh, I guarantee you people forget to make that change uh, when people leave. So um, something to stay on top of, make sure they're on top of, and always a good reminder that maybe even, you know, annually double check everything and make sure they're up to date. Intellectual property. This is probably the most popular area of law for people to talk about. People love the all the trademark disputes that happen. Um, the biggest issue here is, and again, to small businesses, is I don't think people understand what gives them trademark rights and what doesn't. Uh, it's infinitely, well, I shouldn't, infinitely may not be right. It's definitely more difficult in alcohol than um, virtually most other products because you can't just put alcohol on the internet and sell it across state lines. Um, there is a lot of, what's the word I want? Uh, maybe disagreement in the industry about what constitutes interstate commerce. Uh, I'm still of the attitude that interstate commerce means more than one state. Um, because why do you need a federal trademark if you're not, you know, participating in acti public activities in other states, whether it's sales, competitions, or festivals? Um, and then, of course, you know, who's going to challenge those? And we have more and more situations of large companies. Uh, most recently, um, there was an article about Hershey's has, I, and, and the belief is that due to a licensing agreement with Yinglings, uh, with Yingling, and I can't remember what, what beer it is or what product, but 
they went on a cease and desist kind of rampage. And anyone who ever had a beer that referred to or in any way sounded like a Hershey's product, uh, they sent a cease and desist to. And not just a cease and desist, but asked for damages. Um, so that that was an interesting one. You've got a lot more um, public figures, bands who are you know doing collaborations, and that is also bringing in more potential trademark um, potential infringements. I think it depends, but uh, more to think about and more to understand about how the trademarks work. Um, so. Um, always that that's generally my my most interesting and the part i i love discussing the most but i'm gonna hold back the time Oop. okay uh i see another question i will talk about that at the end um there's a question about cannabis and alcoholic beverages um i will yeah i'll discuss that at the end that's it's a pretty quick and easy answer so um employment law Huge area of of problems within, and again, I assume any small business, mainly because California is a very difficult state with numerous employment um, regulations um, and and updates and changes to those regulations. Employment law changes constantly. I don't know how employment lawyers do it. I think I would go nuts with how quickly so many things change. Um, and thank God we have employment lawyers who can answer those questions. But really what you run into is these guys just don't, they're not violating employment law on purpose. They just don't always know what the rules are. Um, and so it, it's really just a matter of helping them stay compliant and keeping them updated on what's going on. I actually, right this morning, I sat in on a, uh, 2022 employment law <laughs> webinar to make sure I had, you know, my my brain uh, keyed into the most important things. Um, and this was an hour and a half webinar that went uh, almost two hours. So, uh, and a, a, a big part of that last half hour was COVID. So, because again, everything's changing almost daily of what an employer is required to do, depending on the situation. So. Um, it's just really hard for them to keep up. So uh, helping them understand what the rules are, what the regulations are, and what they need to do to be compliant uh, is huge. Um, oh, and so complicated. Uh, big, big issue in the industry right now, uh, and, and has been, I'd say, for the last six to nine months, uh, is sexual harassment. Uh, if you aren't aware, Last, I want to say it was the beginning of last summer, uh, and it it was such kind of a grassroots thing that just happened. So there was a a brewer, and I can't remember where she was based, um, who randomly put on Instagram a story about something that happened to her, where I think it wasn't a coworker, but someone had come into the brewery and basically whistled at her, kind of like you would whistle to a dog, like to come here. And she's like, how many other people have dealt with crap like this? And oh my God, the floodgates opened and not just women, but um, people of color, like all over the industry was just this outpouring and flood of uh, discriminatory things that had happened to people. And, and not always by a coworker. Um, sometimes it was, you know, by a vendor, by a customer. Um, but it really brought, uh, to the head of the industry or to the front of everyone's brain, just how much harassment took place in this industry. And, you know, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is alcohol. I mean, I've, I've worked in a number of different industries, um, you know, as a woman. And I, you know, it's, I don't think it's necessarily more prevalent in this industry, but I do think that when people are drinking, you have lowered inhibitions, people aren't thinking, and um, things happen. Uh, people say things they would not necessarily say otherwise, do things they wouldn't necessarily do otherwise, etc. So alcohol, I think, exacerbates what um, is already out there uh, as well. And I mean, and this is, okay, so, and this is, by the way, just my opinion. 
Um, I do think there is a tendency in this industry to treat certain um, brewers, founders, or certain people that just kind of get treated like rock stars. And I, I've kind of, and I say it jokingly, but maybe, and maybe this is because I was in the music industry before I went to law school, but if you treat people like rock stars, they tend to start acting like rock stars. So I think there were people who, and, and, and I don't want to put anything, you know, being spirited behind it, but people just start to act differently. Anyway, um, there were a lot of accusations, uh, a lot of, you saw a lot of changes at a lot of companies. Um, certainly where there were multiple reports of um, harassment, discrimination, and uh, a lot of changes uh, took place. But um, I'm pretty sure if lawsuits have been filed, we, we're going to be seeing them. I'm sure they have been. Uh, obviously, that's not something that gets into the news a lot necessarily, but um, really, really important to educate, to train people, and try and prevent this from happening. Um, certainly something that that's kind of the, the direction I've taken with my clients. Um, so it's, like I said, it's it's everywhere, but this is the industry we're in, and the more we can help eliminate it, the better. Bankruptcy law. Unfortunately, as the industry grows and as COVID has uh, been happening, um, some businesses just don't make it. And we've definitely seen, especially the thought of COVID, um, probably more people have had to either close or find an alternative way of doing business. I definitely have quite a few people who have, um, you know, closed their facility gotten out from under, you know, that overhead and turned to contract brewing or an alternating proprietorship because there's a lot less uh, capital, it's a lot less capital intensive, but you can still make the product and get it out there without necessarily having your own facility, um, making it a little bit easier financially. Um, and I think we'll see more and more of that. Um, and, and whether or not it's because of COVID or other reasons. I, mean, I definitely know that you, a lot of people, again, after the balance sale, you had a lot of people getting into this business expecting one thing and maybe it hasn't turned out to be what they thought it would be. And maybe they, they just don't want to do it anymore. Um, you know, there's a lot of different reasons for those changes. Um, but unfortunately, bankruptcy is sometimes uh, the way they're going to go. Uh, sometimes they can find a way to, you know, avoid that. But um, Unfortunately, I guess it's the, the nature of business. So, okay, this is truly a huge, huge impact on the industry, um, both from closings, new business models, and employment law issues. Um, like I said, a big part of the presentation I watched this morning was about all the regulations currently. Um, that employers need to think about, know about, deal with uh, in regards to COVID, in regards to outbreaks, um, vaccinations. Can you require people to be vaccinated? Um, you know, if someone has to stay home, do I have to pay them? If they have to quarantine, uh, what do I do if there's an outbreak? There's so many different things that you've got to know. There was a point during COVID, I think last year, that I did a flow chart. Like, okay, if this happens, you do this. If this happens, you go here. Um, and I mean, but everything keeps changing, which is understandable because, you know, we keep learning more. We get a new strain, different, you know, different things happen. It's, you know, more people are vaccinated. What does that mean? How does this work? What can I do? Um, uh, the state alcohol agency made a lot of concessions and allowances during COVID to help businesses. And most of those were, you know, initially supposed to expire. A lot of things have been extended. So, of course, like, what can we do? Can we still do this? Do we need to stop doing this? Um, where is that going? Are those going to be permanent? Um, a lot of issues and questions regarding um, selling direct to consumers, especially over the Internet which in the past has always been difficult because with alcohol, 
you can't necessarily just sell to someone in another state and ship it to them. Um, the each state has its own requirements and its own regulations. Uh, I think, as I recall at the moment, there are only six states that allow anyone to ship direct to consumer. Uh, one of those only allows you to ship direct to their consumers if you allow them to ship direct to yours. And California definitely doesn't allow that. So unfortunately, we cannot ship direct to Oregon because we won't let Oregon ship direct to our consumers. Um, but there's a lot of question whether or not and how that's going to change uh, in a kind of a post-COVID world. Uh, as well, uh, uh, the other big change I think that I've seen is just the, the various beverages that people are starting to get into. So seltzer, hard seltzers become huge, and that is something that you do and can make under a brewing license. So there are a lot of questions with seltzer, and to some extent, depending on how the seltzer is made, uh, you run into different regulations on how it needs to be labeled. So if your seltzer is sugar-based, it, you still make an underbrewing license, but you have to label it uh, as per FDA guidelines. If it is a malt base, then you actually do um, submit your label to the feds, uh, to the federal uh, alcohol agency, and get a certificate of label approval. So, um, and these things, they're not changing daily, but every time someone comes up with a new, a new beverage, then we got to figure out, like, okay, where does this fall in the current model, and how do we how do we work that? Um, so, okay, so about four minutes earlier than I planned to stop. Um, we have one question, which I can probably. So this uh, there's a question regarding state of the law dealing with cannabis, THC, and or CBD and alcoholic beverages. So I'll make that so. The quick answer is that you cannot put THC in alcohol. Um, what you can put in alcohol is um, federally approved um, CBD. So you, you definitely cannot have THC. Um, the CBD that you use, you have to, anytime you put something in alcohol that is not water, malt, yeast, or hops, or on an already approved um, accepted list of ingredients, you have to get formula approval. This is whether or not it's crossing state lines. This is kind of the alcohol version of the FDA to make sure you're not putting something into the, the, um, into the marketplace that uh, is going to be unhealthy or um, not unhealthy, but not for Something that people shouldn't uh, imbibe. I don't know. How, I don't know how to phrase this correctly, but anyway. Um, for example, I had a kombucha that had. Um, I'm trying what the ingredient was. Blue spirulina. I'm not even sure what that is, but that is apparently not improved, not approved to go into alcoholic beverages, and so the TTB turned it down. So. My point on that is that when you're doing formula approval for a CBD-based beer, um, TTB, the federal alcohol agency, is going to want to approve the CBD that's going into the um, the product. My so and and to that, there have been some CBD beers in the marketplace. Uh, New Belgium had one. The one thing I noticed about that, and and I think the one other. Um, that have been out there is that they're really expensive. So you're paying, so a normal pint of beer, craft beer, let's say is $7. A pint of CBD beer is more like $15. <laughs> my, so my thought process is this, the requirement of the type of CBD to go into the beer is that you're paying for a very, very expensive um, ingredient in order to pass the TTB's requirement because they want to make sure there's no THC. Um, so you're putting in a very expensive ingredient that is requiring the brewer to raise the price of the beer, which requires the distributor to raise the price. And then, of course, the... Um, um, retailer to raise the price. So now you've got a pint of beer that's $15 instead of seven or eight. 
based on that, then you've got a consumer who's like, that sounds really cool. I'm going to try that. And I would suspect if you sell a lot of one pint of $15 beers for someone to taste it and go, yeah, that's, that doesn't taste any different <laughs> than the 7 or $8 pint that I can get of this IPA that tastes almost the same. So my guess is that the reason you're not seeing them is that for the few people who have done it, it's not cost effective. Just my, my guess. Um, but that's kind of my thought. But no, you definitely cannot put THC in beer and you cannot even have THC on the, and this is California specific, on uh, the premises of any alcoholic manufacturer or retailer. Um, so, well, actually, let me take that back. I'm not even sure. I, I won't say that about the retailer simply because I don't, I don't work with bars and restaurants. I work with manufacturers. But as an alcohol manufacturer, you cannot have THC on your premises. Uh, I think the only exception to that might be doctor prescribed uh, cannabis. Um, but yeah, the, the California uh, is keeping um, our uh, substances very separate. Uh, so. Let's see. <laughs> it is a lot like, I, I don't even think Belgian beers uh, are $15 a pint. But uh, like I said, I, I think what it comes down to is what the, um, you know, what's the consumer willing to pay, which is what all business I think should come down to in general. Uh, and then is it worth it? So I don't know. Maybe we'll see more down the road. I doubt it. Not, not until something changes along that way. So, um, okay, let's see, was there, I have one more slide. Okay, my last slide is really just a reminder that breweries are incessant do-it-yourselfers. They would rather do everything themselves and not pay a lawyer or an accountant or, you know, a market. They don't want to pay anyone to do anything. They want to do it all themselves as much as possible. But the more you can educate them on the fact that there are just some things that they really should not do themselves, uh, the better. And I mean, and I will say too, you know, they, they definitely will learn the hard way sometimes, unfortunately. Um, but that's pretty much, I guess, just the nature of, of these kind of clients. So um, any other questions that anyone, and it doesn't have to be about what I presented. I mean, I'll, Happy to answer questions about anything related to craft beer or even, you know, having your own law firm <laughs> or law practice or whatever it is I have these days. Um, I keep looking this way because my other screen is where it shows the chat and the question and answers. So. Well, I guess we're ending early. Come back in and encourage people to ask questions. We want to be able to give you an hour of CLE today, so <laughs> let's keep uh, keep Candace talking here. Candace, I was looking at your website. I just wanted to mention that it's craftbeerattorney.com uh, for anyone who wants to take a look at it. It looks like you've got a newsletter there that people can sign up for. A lot of the information looks like it would be beneficial for any small business, really, not just craft beer. So you might want to want to take a look at that. Are there any other resources that you will recommend to people maybe oh. thinking about getting into this business besides your website, of course? Um, actually, uh, yes, as a matter of fact, I'm glad you said that. Um, so recently, um, God, I think, it, well, I say recently, but I think it's been about a year at this point. I um, partnered with uh, another consultant in the craft beer industry, and we started a website uh, called startabrewery.com. And it's basically just a big repository of information about really that anyone who is opening a brewery uh, or or has a brewery looking to grow could uh, benefit from. So it's, I mean, there is, there's definitely some legal information. It is written for uh, brewers. So, but at the same time, we're always looking for contributors. I actually, you know, I had, sent a message to an attorney on the East coast recently to see if he wanted to contribute. It's, but if, even if you're just looking to learn about the industry, um, there's a lot of information available. Um, 
The other thing I, you know, I, since we do have a little bit more time and, and so we all get our full hour, I will actually go back to trademarks and basically um, share a little information that a lot of people don't realize. Uh, and, and when I say a lot of people, I mean attorneys, um, because I, I run into this all the time. It's really important to realize the trademark office, and this is different than it was um, a few years ago when I, well, actually not a few, but when I started 10 years ago. But today, so when you're registering or applying for a trademark for a client for beer or wine or spirits, um, you've got to be aware. So even though beer and wine and spirits are two different classes of goods, you're going to see um, the trademark office considers them all the same. So if you, especially if you're doing a clearance for a beer mark and there's a wine or a winery or a spirit or a distillery with the same name, you're going to get a rejection. The trademark office considers those the same. Uh, so be aware of that because I've definitely had a lot of people have issues with that where they thought they could get a mark and then they were rejected because of that. Um, as well, you'll see rejections based on restaurants and bar services. Um, because a lot of restaurants and bars do um, private labeling. So they will, and many times, do that as well. Or reject um, a beer mark for a bar or a restaurant. Um, okay, so I did, I got another question. One thing. Uh, patent infringements and trade secret disputes. Do I see a lot of those? Um, I... I, uh, and the, the person said, I can imagine someone from company A saying company B stole my half of ice and recipe. Um, I definitely don't see patent infringements um, basically because recipes are considered trade secrets. Um, and believe it or not, I haven't seen any trade secret disputes. However, what I have pointed that out that it is a potential. So most brewers tend to believe that they, uh, they're the only ones who can make their beer the way it tastes. As a matter of fact, Pliny the Elder, which is one of the most popular IPAs in the world, um, the brewer basically printed the recipe in a brewing magazine. This was years ago. Um, as I said, brewers, I mean, it is more than a recipe, I will say. Also, um, where it is made, is is potentially very much going to affect the flavor as well. If you ask anyone who is a huge Alpine beer fan, when Alpine sold to Green Flash and Green Flash started making the Alpine beers, most people felt they could taste the difference. Um, my guess in that case is it was the water. Alpine was using water where they were, and Green Flash, like many many large breweries, uses like a filtration system to take out all the minerals of the local water and then have a very pure to the recipe taste. Um, so that that would be my explanation of the, the taste difference. So there there are other factors than just the recipe. Um, plus, I think it would be very hard to prove that someone took the recipe, um, as I'm guessing that most trade secret cases in general aren't very easy, mainly because breweries aren't very good about keeping things confidential. They're not very good about not telling other people, uh, leaving it lying around, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, but I will say this. I had a situation years ago where a number of employees went from company A to company B. So company B had like at least three, if not four employees from company A. And oddly enough, company B started making, whereas let's say previously they were making Belgian beers, they were now making very, um, not making Belgian beers and making very um, IPAs, lagers, et cetera, um, which oddly enough were the same type of beers made by company A, where all these people used to work. Um, so I, I got to make a fun phone call to brewery B, company B, and, and just let them know that this could look like a trade secret situation and that they should probably make sure it's not. And, you know, so, but I've yet to see any cases for that. So I don't know. I, I don't know if it's just that it's too hard to prove. I mean, you'd have to have a hell of a good palate to be able to say this is the same recipe, I think. But, um, so... And then there's just a comment about cores, <laughs> which I will not, I won't, I won't respond to. 
Um, but nah, they're not a craft beer, so uh, not not my area of expertise. But um, other questions? I'm starting to think of anything else I could let you know about. Um, you know, as far as things that you wouldn't. Oh, okay. Another thing to look for. So if you are doing a business formation um, with investors, um, just be aware that for both the feds and the ABC, anyone who's 10% or more has to be on the license. So one thing I make sure to do is put in my operating agreements, like especially if anyone's leaving and anyone else is either coming in to take over or an existing owner may be moving up to the 10% level that you know they're going to need to pass the background checks with with abc and the feds and so that's not a not a transfer that can be made if they're not a not willing to do a fingerprint check excuse me or if they do not pass that background check so i don't know i was trying to think of more little tips i could throw in so candace i wanted to make sure you showed your slide with your contact information while we're well, you know what? Additional questions. And I am an idiot because I realized I didn't put one there. So I'm going <laughs> to type it in the chat right now. Just my email address, which is Candace at craftbeerattorney.com. Pretty easy to remember. And as you so, so thankfully mentioned earlier, uh, my website is craftbeerattorney.com. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm. I am personally not taking on new clients, but I have um, another attorney that um, that has been helping me on a contract basis, and we're we're looking to make that more formal this year. Um, so, if you do need help, we can probably provide it. I say I'm trying not to take on new clients, and yet every once in a while I do anyway. So, I'm not good at saying no. <laughs> And then, as you mentioned, you have the new website, startabrewery.com. Oh, yes. You might want to take a look at as well as your craft beer attorney. Yes. And like I said, that that one's going to have a lot more than legal stuff. It, it It's very much created. It's free. Or, I mean, it, there's no cost to it. Like I said, it's, it's basically just a big repository of information that, you know, consultants that I've met over the years, we've just kind of put together. Um and you know we're we're running it through um, advertising from. Oh, that is disabled. Okay, well here, can I type my answer to the Q and think I'm, I, I think I fixed it, but let me see if I can. Here, I'll do this also, and that way it's in more than one place. Oh, okay, I answered it, so it went away. I don't know how that works. Oh, if you click under answered. And you go down to the question about my email address, the last question, it's in there. If for some reason it, oh, nope, there's the chat. Okay. Well, it's now in the chat and in the question and answer as the last answered question. So multiple places for you. And that's Candace at craft attorney.com. I'm trying to put it in the chat. I don't know if this is going to work. No, it's funny because so, so a lot of people like will get it wrong because they spell attorney wrong, but I'm guessing you guys will all get that right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I think we're about out of time. So thank you so much, Candace, and everyone who joined us today. Thank you guys. I appreciate uh, all the participants. It's kind of exciting to see it. This is more people than to come live. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.